those of you who missed it and uh let's make a decision today uh whether we go forward with it or not um Let all right jeff here. yeah i'm getting ready to share the screen um and um is this visible yeah okay so this there's again but we discussed this a week ago, and then we discussed it for some part of our Monday meeting this week. Um, and as I mentioned, Monday, Monday, I haven't made a change to it. It's, it's just what we showed Thursday. I think it's Ben said, you know, he wanted to soak a little, um, and um, and that's fine. And so this is what we have. And uh, I put the link to this in um, Sig Storage Cozy channel. Um, and if you if you look at that link or I'm scrolling up to where I've listed some benefits of this proposal. Um, and and I, what do I have above that? I just, I just have a workflow, I think. Um, anyway, the, the link is in SIG storage. If you uh, cozy, if you scroll up a little bit, um, I've been making changes to this document not related to this proposal. And so I have a table of contents in it now that you can click to get to this diagram. So that's where we are, Sid. Um, um, what would you like? Would you like me to go over the workflow again or just uh, we can just discuss it, ask questions? Yeah, so uh, I think there are some new people here today. And also I'm not sure if... Uh, Vianney and uh, Nicholas got a chance to uh, look at this new architecture and review it. Um, uh, I'll give a quick, uh, quick, uh, you know, uh, summary of why we're doing this. Um, so, with our current design, we have this, uh, we have this design where, uh, when we want to share buckets uh, between namespaces, uh, we end up creating copies of the bucket. Um, literally another bucket object is created by uh, probably a different name. Um, and and uh, it leads to a bunch of problems around uh, who holds the source of truth and, and how deletion can be facilitated uh, in such a way that if there are other consumers, uh, we, we respond in the right way. Um, so we wanted to come up with a model where we don't have this weird bucket copy mechanism but rather uh, have references uh, in, in a more intuitive way uh, between uh, namespaces that are requesting the same bucket. Um, so that's, that's when um, Jeff came up with this proposal. Uh, so I'll let Jeff explain the proposal once and then uh, uh, and also explain in, in a quick summary of uh, uh, you know, some of the trade-offs that it brings about and uh, some of us have spent a few weeks on this already, so I'm hoping we make a decision to either go forward with this or not uh, by the end of this meeting. Yeah, so Sid outlined the motivation behind this thinking here. Um, 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 and it, uh, I believe it will make deletion um, cleaner, although Ben has brought up that um, maybe there's another um, another retention uh, a deletion policy we need beside and that's where we talk about force delete versus a sort of a delayed or uh, you know a delayed or lazy delete um but anyway in in this diagram um on the left hand side in namespace one that that is the design we have today in the cap also you have a this is for a greenfield bucket that's going to be shared, ultimately shared in another namespace. So within namespace one, the BR causes the bucket to be created. Bucket one is instantiated uh, in the cluster space. Um, and then there's two, two users in namespace one um, that wanna use that bucket and they just refer to the BR as today. Um, and, and, and then, so with the two BARs, you get two bucket access instances, BA1 and two as shown, and they're cluster scoped. Uh, and they point to, um, they point to, both point to bucket one. Okay, now in, in sharing a bucket in a different namespace is where we, we do this cloning today. Um, and this proposal addresses that. 
So what we have in namespace two is we want access to the same bucket, bucket one. Um, we, we, we create a BAR and instead of that BAR pointing to a, a BR in namespace two, it points to bucket one directly. That's the, that's the crux of the change. That's the main change right there. Um, and um, BAR also causes uh, bucket access instance three to be created and it also points to bucket one. So uh, this represents sharing within a namespace, sharing outside of a namespace. It's been pointed out it's not symmetric between the two use cases of sharing and that's, that's true. Um, but it's cleaner and um, it's been pointed out how does BAR3 know the name of bucket one um, if they don't have RBAC rules that allow them to list it or, you know, how do they just know that name? And, and, and the answer to that is the same as the current KEP design. Uh, if we were doing sharing in namespace two, the user in namespace two would have had to create BR2 and BR2 would have pointed to bucket one. So they still needed to know the name of bucket one. So this isn't introducing anything new in terms of a user knowing the name of bucket one, but it is not symmetric between namespaces that are sharing a bucket. Hey, Jeff, um, this has been, uh, yeah. one issue did float back into my mind that informed our original design, which was if you want to share a bucket across Kubernetes clusters, you'll unavoidably have to clone the bucket to the other cluster and create another BR. Or I guess you wouldn't have to create another BR with the new proposal. You would just have to clone the bucket and then point some BAs at it or BARs at it. But um, you, you, the moment you go across clusters, you, you, you can't avoid cloning the, the bucket, right? You right. want to sure. share it across clusters. So, so that one of the benefits of the original design was it makes cross namespace sharing identical to cross cluster sharing, right? The thing that you would do to share across clusters is the same thing you do to share across namespaces. You clone the bucket, you create a BR that points to the bucket, and then you just use that in your namespace and it's the same process. So, um, and- Except and, and that- well, it helped push us towards towards the original design months ago. So as we look at this new design, we should ask ourselves, what is what does cross cluster sharing look like, and are we happy with it? Because I, I don't want to say like this is a showstopper, but it does it does remind us that there are still situations where you are going to have two copies of the bucket. You are going to have a, an issue like what if one guy deletes it while the other guy is using it? You know the or what if what if if we end if we ever end up supporting mutation, how do you control which which one of the Kubernetes clusters is allowed to perform the mutations? You know, th those kinds of questions will remain uh, even in the new design. <clears throat> yeah, and and along with that, we also need to answer um, how much more important uh, that use case is, uh, because I don't think there's one answer that's right or wrong, but rather uh, trade off. Uh, so, so if you can uh, clearly answer uh, how important that other use cases, which is uh, cloning across uh, clusters, um, as compared Sh to sharing um, across clusters, right? That's what you want to achieve. Yeah, Sh sharing by cloning. It, it's well, I mean, a, I, I, yeah, we don't have it. We don't have another proposal for sharing across clusters. Um, but... Right. Okay. Sharing ac across clusters being the same as sharing across namespaces versus sharing across clusters being different. Um, right, okay. Yeah, that's what I meant to say, yeah. I mean, I think the sharing across clusters is going to be, have some kind of cloning if you're trying, I mean, it's, you're going to have multiple, across clusters, you're gonna have multiple instances abstracting a, a, a single physical resource, whether that's a volume or, or a bucket, right? And so right. I don't think, I don't think that I don't think that's avoidable. Um, yeah. Right, right. And, and so, so uh, recognizing that in the original design, we said, why not just make cross namespace sharing identical to to all the other forms of sharing, and say, look, we're going to have to to copy the bucket in some cases. So why not copy it in all cases and make everything just collapse down into one use case? 
Yeah, go, but go. in that case, you're cloning then if we, if we, in this example, you would, um, it, in this example of two namespaces sharing buckets, we would, we would have um, a bucket one and a bucket two then, right? Yep. And um, so you would, and now if you talk about cross cluster, then you're going to clone um, bucket one and bucket two will be in cluster one and will be in cluster two. And they all are representing a single physical bucket. No, no, you'd have bucket three in cluster two, referring to the same thing. And uh, again, yeah, if yeah. every namespace that wanted to use it, you'd have to copy it again. But, but, but in that world, it becomes very obvious that every one of the buckets needs policy information to tell you, may I delete it? May I, may I mutate it? You know, all that information, because you need a way to, you know, when there is, when there is two clusters, they can't talk to each other. You need a mechanism to decide who has the power. And it has to yeah, be, I don't it see how it's, it's on the, it's on the bucket. Guess, yeah, I guess you're saying the benefits of whatever we're doing uh, may not be, you know, maybe completely uh, taken away uh, as soon as we have to, you know, have buckets be shared across clusters. Right. That, that was the argument I made mm -hmm. months ago when we when we were pushing for this the scheme that we now have as as the design was was. So if we question this. <laughs> Um, what, like, how is this different from like the static brownfield? What do we call the static brownfield? Right. It, it looks very much like like brownfield when you get to the second clusters because you didn't make the thing. It's right. something that exists out there that you want to get a pointer to. Right. It, In case of static brownfield, uh, you know, we we don't really care about you know because we're not involved in the creation life cycle. We don't get involved in the deletion life cycle as well. In the sense, if it happens outside of uh, uh, the scope of Cozy. We just, you know, we just let it happen. We we just deal with it. Um, would that be a good enough answer here? Answer I guess like a static brownfield case. I, I don't remember how we do the green to brown transition. Like if you start off creating it inside Kubernetes, but then you decide, oh, I actually wanted to, to treat it like a brownfield bucket now and, and have Kubernetes stop, I mean, stop managing it and just, have access to it but what 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 do you do i mean the transition? other way is what i meant like you create it outside of kubernetes and then you want to start using it right right that, that is the pure brownfield situation mm -hmm. and we have a pure greenfield situation but with the third one we talked about was transitioning from green to brown so you you created it inside kubernetes and then you decided you never want to delete it or you know you want to promote it into basically a brownfield bucket so there's some you can't just delete it in kubernetes obviously because that'll delete the bucket so how do you transition from your greenfield bucket to a brownfield bucket. So, so, uh, quick. so the, when we met, when we said green to brownfield, we meant that greenfield was when it's in, in, in the created namespace, it's greenfield, and then any other namespace that wanted to use it becomes brownfield. Um, that's what right. we call green to brown. Yeah, this coming to your, reflects yeah. green to brown. Br one created bucket one mm -hmm. as greenfield bucket, and now they're sharing it. The rest of the BARs are like BAR3 for sure is, you know, as an example of brown. So this is green to brown in the diagram. So, okay, but, but, but it's, it's still, I mean, the namespace one could still delete it if you wanted to. Yeah, and, so that, that, and that was a good discussion we had then. Um, that, yeah. uh, what happens if namespace, if you delete BR1, what happens to bucket one and what happens to the back end bucket? Um, like like, like what, what, I, what I'm contemplating is, is what if we say before you can share it, you have to, sort of go through a brownfield conversion. Uh, and then then once you share it, it's basically already brown. And what's the benefit of that? Yeah. Well it would it would it would remove a set of use cases where you have this combination of one namespace can mutate it and delete it, but nobody else can, but other people can still see it. And it would force you to either say, look, it's all green, in which case it's stuck inside the namespace and it can never leave or it's brown, in which case everyone can share it, but nobody has access to delete it or do anything that manages the life cycle, right? It, it, would, it would clearly split you into one use case or the other, right? Right now, I think the extra complexity in the design comes out of the fact that we want to do both at the same time. And I'm saying, well, why? Like, well, why not just force you to, to flip a switch when you want to start sharing a bucket and say, I, I am now converting this bucket to the brownfield use case. And from this point on, 
you know everyone can see it and everyone can share it but like i i'm not treating it like a greenfield bucket that where i'm managing the life cycle anymore yeah i see that that does make things more uniform now yeah now uh, how would you deal with deletion there it would become someone else's problem or 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 you'd need to introduce a brown to green transition to go back the other direction you know and say okay i, I am now reassuming control and and i promise that i'm not sharing it with anyone when i do that um so that you know you could get it back into the state where you could control I mean, it again. Really i'm afraid we are complicating it a little bit yeah uh, well i i no i i mean it, it sounds complicated but i'm literally imagining like this process involving flipping a bit and deleting an object to go from green to brown and then to go from brown to green it would be flipping another bit and creating a new object and you're back in the green field like i'm imagining some very simple mutation that that uh switches you between the two modes um <clears throat> isn't that also harder to okay so um just from the user's perspective it, it seems harder but you know maybe not this is this is this well, has more to do with how we we build this we, we, we've always said that when you go across namespaces you need you can, an ordinary user can't do it by himself right right you, you need someone with that many powers so an, an ordinary user will always be stuck in the greenfield world and then to get into the brownfield world you're going to need help from an admin or powerful controller and we could just say that you know to to transition back and forth is another function of that controller um okay so okay so we have we have uh, well, okay so we have multiple questions here the first one is um is is this approach the one that jeff has is projecting right now better than what we earlier had um and and if the answer to that is yes even with the problems that you mentioned um we can for, for for just one cluster i would say it's yes yeah but once you get into the multi cluster sharing it, I, i i kind of struggle to see how it's any better how how important is multi cluster sharing because I, I, you know the the bucket is being created uh, with the context of the cluster in which it's created it's a, like i think we talked about it at one point where um, no, no, the ground field will eventually go away i think even you said that um the idea being you create the buckets on the fly as you use it and then they go away when the workload's done um so how much more important or how important is sharing across clusters well the the brownfield case i mean in any situation where you're sharing i think mm -hmm. sharing across clusters is is exactly as valid as sharing across namespaces yeah but i don't i, I don't oh, hold on i'm not sure of that why and and i i want to make one other assertion which is the the bucket exists outside the cluster like this is not a resource that is internal to kubernetes such that if you deleted the kubernetes cluster itself the resource would go away like if you just nuke the whole kubernetes cluster the bucket will survive that um and so it is outside the cluster in a very real sense and it's logical to want to share it across clusters if you have lots yeah, of clusters there's there's buckets so, so clearly there's uh, systems who are internal to the cluster right there's two cases here yeah that's uh, the sharing across namespaces part yes and then mm -hmm. that's true of all of p of volumes they're out so usually they're out so most of them or many of them right right so so, so there's so, one so, difference there though you can't really share a volume that easily if someone else is using it unless it's say nfs or something but, but um, you can yeah, share say it's a file system volume you know nfs nfs cluster yeah. Yeah. file Wait, and and, and you can share cluster. snapshots right like like you can have a snapshot that was created in one cluster and you can share it with another kubernetes cluster and then allow yeah. people to clone from it and like that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do if both those kubernetes clusters have access to the same storage but but snapshot so, is is a different right like the semantics of a snapshot is the copying is a very core part of snapshotting Yeah, like the whole cool. whole snapshot itself. I mean, in the case of snapshotting, it makes a lot more sense to copy even in between namespaces. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think? Uh, like yeah. because, because that's what you're doing, right? I I don't know how snapshot is implemented. I no, think you no know more. You're not copying. I mean, if the for example, the the snapshot can be located outside the cluster completely, and then you're not copying anything. You're just referring to it, right? Yeah. But volume, volume is the same thing, right? It's not just snapshot. Volume. You can also import a volume. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
but Can there's I, I think that it's it's still dual i mean there there are cases where the the bucket or volume or snapshot is really you know hosted inside the cluster somewhere mm -hmm. okay physically yeah, you're you're, you're talking about like the software that implements the, the object storage is running as a right. pod. In, yes, yes. So there are, there are those cases, but like you would never do the brownfield situation for those, or you would never share across clusters, presumably, if, if this. Oh, I mean, it's still possible to share across no. clusters. Why not? I mean, yeah. we're just we're just imagining different cases here. In one, the, 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 like the bucket uh, itself is being hosted on a Kubernetes cluster. It doesn't mean that. I'm not sharing it with other clusters then. Okay, let yeah, me ask the question this way. So uh, if, if this is a benefit within the cluster, I mean, like if you're just sharing within the cluster, if this approach is better. Now I wanna ask this question, if we were to go with this approach, do you think we can come up with a solution for the across cluster use case um, down the line? Or do you think that might be a really hard thing to do and we shouldn't well, go forward with this approach right now? Well, I, I was just outlining it at the beginning. You know, what you you would you definitely would have to create another copy of the bucket in the other mm -hmm. cluster, mm -hmm. but you could forego any creation of any BRs in any namespaces and just start creating BARs that pointed to the bucket in all of the various namespaces that wanted to use it in the new cluster. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And 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 of course now you have no way of deleting it other than an admin deleting the bucket object. We could come uh, up with a primitive saying, you know, if it's brownfield, then, you know, you don't deal with the life cycle of the bucket. Static brownfield, sorry. Well, right, right. So, so, so why are we, think, I'm sorry, why don't we allow it to be deleted? You can still delete it. Right? I mean, like we're trying to see, uh, you know, if there's a way to work with, uh, the whole idea behind this approach is, the approach that Jeff is projecting right now is, we want to avoid copying buckets. Um, but along with that comes a lot more benefits also. Uh, now, in, in what we do is when we go across uh, uh, clusters, we basically lose those benefits because we're copying anyways. Yes. And, and but, but I mean, to, to Shing's question, like somebody can delete it, but if you have two different Kubernetes clusters that have references to it, you need to be very careful about how and when you delete it. Yeah, that's the thing. How are you going to even count to the referencing now? It's a well, so, clusters. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Well, you, you couldn't rely on referencing. You'd have to rely on some policy on the bucket that says, you know, the deletion policy is retained so that it doesn't. So that go nobody, away. nobody can actually delete it, basically, in that case. Well, the, the well, admin can delete it. No, no, I mean, I'm sorry. Well, but the admin, admin also admin still, when there's a the policy. Object, right? Well, even on, the the even on the bucket, there's a policy, right? That's the one that we should uh, honor, right? The bucket, if on the bucket it says return, then it should always be returned. Yeah, right. in that case, we expect them to do out of band, just like with PVs. Yeah, I, I think measuring this in a multi-cluster environment is not um, consistent with how other KEPs and other even current projects are being measured right now, Ben. Um, and, and until we have a cube fed to or something where resources are visible across clusters uh, by some main cluster controller. Um, I, I just don't think that's a fair criteria to apply right now. Well, I, no. so I, I, I don't agree. I, I think, I mean, this is one of the unique aspects of storage relative to most other, I mean, most other things, networking, compute, everything sort of by its nature exists inside the cluster, but storage is the special thing that tends to exist outside the cluster that the cluster has to make use of. The um, load balances could be outside. I mean, you can do other things. I mean, a storage is a great example of it. Um, yeah. But I would say all storage, well, all file and object are, um, I guess block doesn't fit, but. Um, it, it, it just seems to me that um, if, if, if I was, but, you know, if, if I did have a whole you know, bunch of Kubernetes clusters that I was doing various things on and I wanted to share data between them, an object store is the obvious way to provide storage that is accessible across all of my Kubernetes clusters. Like what, there, there's no better way than object storage to achieve that. Um, and so it seems like one of the, the best cases for object storage is to say, I will create a bucket and I'll share it with all 12 of my Kubernetes clusters. And now developers you know, running their pods, who, who knows where can all access the same data. Isn't that great? Um, 
Yeah, I agree actually. <laughs> so I see, I see you're, you're outlining the importance of uh, uh, sharing across clusters, and and I'm actually convinced. Um, but but coming back to uh, now, you know, now, now I, I I don't necessarily want to say like you have to do that with Cozy, right? Like you can still use object storage right. outside of Cozy, right? Right. And, that's and maybe that's the answer. But like object storage and multi Kubernetes cluster environments have clearly go together. <clears throat> And and the question is, should Cozy accommodate that fact, or should we try to ignore it and say that's not the our use case that we're interested in? We're only interested in the, you know, the more of the green field where Kubernetes is actually managing the lifecycle for you, <clears throat> which will be no, okay. I think the use case. Is, oh, whoops, you might not hear me. I just got a message that says my internet's in, unstable. We can hear can you. Guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. But then I, I, I think you make a good point of object storage and multi-cluster. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, however, I what I have trouble um, agreeing with is that it's a problem that Cozy should solve because I think it's a bigger multi-cluster, although object storage is a great use case for multi-cluster, it's a bigger problem than that. And it's been, you know, there's been Ubernetes, there's been, Cube fed one and cube fed <laughs> two. We've had work in multi cluster that doesn't seem to stick. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a current effort now. Um, so I I think when some subset of Kubernetes resources are visible across clusters is when Cozy would start looking at that. So, so, so the, the reason the reason I personally keep harping on this is because some of some of the work that I do involves storage systems accessed by multiple Kubernetes clusters, and and we have to deal with this. You know, what happens when you have a snapshot that was taken on this Kubernetes cluster, and now you want to clone it on that Kubernetes cluster? Like, it's something that we actually do, and and we and, and we go through the exercise that I outlined, where we copy the the volume snapshot content to the other cluster, and we set the delete policy, and then we create a volume snapshot object reference to it in a namespace. And, and it, it, these are all problems that, like, I deal with, you know, as part of my job. <laughs> so, yeah. so that, that that that's why it's familiar to me, and and I I can just I can easily see it mattering in object storage too. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that's valuable experience. I mean, it's good we have you here. Um, but but what's the other uh, what's the other option like do we have another see uh, it, this approach doesn't make it any worse but it makes it much better within the cluster is is that is that uh, a good reason uh well um so so the thing that it makes better is you don't end up with multiple copies of the bucket but you don't get out of you don't get out of jail on needing to have policy bits on the bucket that tell the controller whether it is allowed to delete the bucket and whether it's allowed to mutate the bucket, um, which was one of the original motivations for not even having two copies of the bucket was, well, we didn't want to have to manage those bits, right? <laughs> um, well, and, and I guess we convinced ourselves that even, even with only one copy of the bucket, you still need a deletion policy. So nothing, so like it, this all started when we were talking about how do you mutate the bucket if it's being shared, right? And the question is, well, which which one is the real one? And and my proposal was, well, you you have to tell us which one is the real one by setting a policy bit on the bucket. And then we said, maybe it's better to not have multiple copies so that it's obvious which one is the real one. And but what I think this discussion is pointing out is that that only helps inside one cluster. The moment you go across clusters, you need that again. So. If you still need the the bit to tell you that this is the real copy of the bucket and that and that it's allowed to like mutate things or delete things or whatever, then aside from then then aside then the only thing you've gained is not needing to have multiple copies of the the actual object, um, and I don't know that uh, I guess I don't know that's a win. It, I could be talked into the, the idea that it's still a win, um, but it's a smaller win than I think we had originally envisioned. Um, I mean, right, because cause, cause we, it, we still don't plan on doing mutation, but it's clear now that if we did mutation, you would want a way to flip it off in the situation where you had shared a bucket across clusters, you didn't want the other cluster to be able to set anything, right? You wanted it to be, to be 
feel like a brownfield case where you where you can only access it but you can't do anything is so, this another way we can we can enable sharing like uh, across clusters like, like think of it as uh, uh, using a bucket like a static brownfield case where a bucket was previously created outside of the cluster and you just want to start using it in cozy maybe we should have some mechanism where no bucket object is created but just bar can point to a static brownfield bucket the AR can point to a static round. What, what is that's not how it works today? Today it points to the bucket again. Yeah, it points to this bucket object. I'm saying, it, and instead we can make it directly point to the back end. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking, yeah. throwing ideas out there, saying, yeah. saying there are other ways to address this issue. Um, the static brownfield case. And we did discuss that a while ago where. We pointed to an endpoint or something. Um, a hope I, I, I'm trying to remember if there was uh, issues with uniqueness of different provisioners could have the same bucket endpoint, but I don't know if that mattered that much matters that much. But for a little bit, we did look at um, instead of a BR pointing or a BAR in this case pointing to the B instance it pointed to the bucket itself the back end bucket yeah the it, question it, was how do you refer to it from the user namespace point of view right well, what the, what name do you provide the, the bar what? is 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 an object with a name and then it would have all of these details in it right but what do you how do you refer to it i mean what do you said the 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 external bucket name do you just tell your tell cozy i want to connect to an external bucket name from that um you know bucket access class and oh, that's yeah, the you, name right you would need to supply all the information that you would originally have gotten from the bucket object you'd have to manually right. supply all of those details somehow yeah something like that <laughs> Uh, my my bigger point was just that you know it's possible to address it other ways too. Um, yeah, I, I, and, I and I'll to admit to uh -huh. I, I don't know much about the the brownfield use case because I, I don't think about it very much. But but it's it's possible that if the brownfield use case is clean enough that that, that we can just say that's what you do for everything other than the the namespace where it was created, and that might be okay. To to, to Jeff's point earlier about identifying the provisioner. I thought the whole point of Brownfield was the provisioners are relevant because we're not managing a life cycle. All you need is to be able to attach and detach the bucket. Right, uh, that's true. If it's Brownfield, there is no provisioner. There's only an attacher. True. So like, it, it's often the same binary, yeah. Same but, code. It's a, it, you know, right, but, the, but it's it's conceptually an entirely different function, and in in yeah. CSI, these are clearly split into separate sidecars. There's a provisioner sidecar that handles lifecycle stuff, and there's an attacher sidecar which handles attaching and detaching. Um, yeah, but but you know CSI has uh, different things because uh, attaching is a, is a much more complex operation and much more involved in terms of how the pod lifecycle behaves. But, but, but it but, makes but crucially... makes a good sense because the the access control the access provisioning for that matter or like the attachment is is just relying on the protocol and not the, the actual driver, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, it, that's true. And and, and the, the most important thing is that is we have brownfield use cases in CSI as well, right? Like we have CSI drivers that don't know how to do anything other than attach and detach. That's all they do. Yeah, I mean, that, that making that distinction is, is not a problem at all. I'm, again, I look at it as an implementation detail. Uh, but yes, in terms of conceptually, sure, we can we can make that distinction. Attacher versus, versus provisioner. And uh, that would simplify how we think about uh, uh, Brownfield, because we now think of it as just something to do with attacher rather than you know, provisioner. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I kind of just think of attach being the grant and detach yeah. being remote. Yeah, and, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's all it is mechanically. But the, the point is, those are the only two non-negotiable things in the whole standard, right? You have to be able to do those two things for a pod to be able to access storage. Beyond those, everything else is optional. <laughs> yeah, once we make it like that, then, then what I just said about having the BR directly point to the bucket uh, for all brownfield cases starts making a lot of sense. 
Okay. And, and then and then issues of mutation and deletion become moot because it's like, well, you know, yeah, the catcher doesn't be... doesn't know how to do those things. And it's a brownfield yeah. bucket, so so of course you can't do those things. Yeah. Um, Okay, well then, then maybe we can continue with this new design mm -hmm. and, have, and the understanding be that when you go across clusters, it's gonna be a brownfield use case. And, mm -hmm. and yes, so you'll, you'll get another copy of the bucket just like you would have if it was a normal brownfield bucket. And, and of course you can't do anything to it other than attach and detach. Right. So, so you, you don't have to worry about being able to delete it or change it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if it gets deleted out from under you, that could always have happened in any brownfield use case. Stuff can get deleted out from under you if somebody goes in. Any use case. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's so it's a non-problem. <clears throat> yeah. I, I guess that the, the the thing that tickles me in the back of my mind is is you know, I still would like to know once you're in the brownfield use case, can you promote yourself back into the greenfield use case through some trickery? Uh, uh, like a transfer of ownership kind of thing. Yeah, like I, I, I always imagine the case of you know you, you created it inside a Kubernetes cluster and then you shared it with a bunch of other clusters, and then for whatever reason the cluster that owned it originally goes away and now you have no way to control it and so you'd like to be able to reassert control on one I mean, of the other clusters. I mean, if, you, if you're if you're okay with killing that cluster, that means you're okay with deleting the bucket too. Isn't that the definition of taking the cluster out? Like take the resources away. I, I, I'm thinking of unplanned cluster destruction. You know, like, you can you can set up a BR again, right? Yeah. Well, you can, you can do it only in brownfield with our current design. I mean, ignore the brownfield case. Just if if you don't have anything, right? You just have an external bucket somewhere, and you want to assume control of that so that you know you now cozy manages lifecycle for that, right? You could carefully construct a bucket and a BR and bind them to each other such that Cozy would never know that it wasn't the thing that created them. True, right? absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, so Just as like long a as PVPVC yeah, construction. As long as there's a, a recipe to sort of do that, mm -hmm. then I, I feel very comfortable saying, yeah, let's, let's make Brownfield this very simple case. And then if somebody wants to get from brown back to green, they, they just have to construct the objects just the right way and, and it's done. <laughs> yeah, I think it's possible to do that construct the object just the right way. Um, as long as we don't maintain any state inside of the uh, driver. I think it's better to make it explicit. That's what, like when we design a uh, one snapshot and one snapshot content, it's mm -hmm. very explicit. You can't really convert between a, what we call, you, if you say green or brown or the pre provision and dynamic case, you can't convert it. There's a source that you have to define ahead of time. Once the source is set, that's immutable. So this way it's easier. Uh, right, but sure. thing with 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 snapshots, like there is a possibility to sort of import a snapshot and then delete it using the new handle, right? Depending on what the deletion. Right, right, is. yeah, that that is possible. Then that's the that's the wrong. That's like the in the pre provision case, right? That's possible. Well, that that, that, that's that is of, possible. But that's a but, that's a gray area because what we're saying here is is what we really want to enable is is just usage, not not assume assuming control such that you could delete it. Of course, with snapshots, you can't do anything but delete from them. So yeah, but, like, I, but I thought you guys are talking about like converting that into a green field, right? It's already brown now, converting that into a green. And right, right. So, so doesn't so look like you, we have a clear is... path to that yet. Well, yeah, we're not going like to- Like wake, I mean, it seems to me wake. I thought we want to avoid that. And now we want to also support that. That's the no, no. problem I'm seeing right now. <laughs> well, what, what uh, Ben is saying is as long as, uh, you know, it, we don't have to provide a mechanism, but if there is a way for the admin to to uh, basically hack a bucket together, put it together. But then that will be a clearly documented method. It's not, it no, shouldn't no. be a hack. No, it should not be a no, hack. No. That, that, then you will have problems in the, the controller will be getting complicated. You will get some uh, like user will run into some problems then they thought it's a bug, yeah, okay. but it's not yeah, yeah. I think that's a fair point, Jing, yeah. But I think I see what, what Ching is saying too. I, yeah. I, we, we could provide a, mecha, a special mechanism on the BR to say, I have a pre-constructed B that I just want you to bind to. And then, and from that point on, you treat it as, as, as if it was Greenfield. Um, so, so we have, we have only 20 minutes. Uh, I want to, in the next few minutes, like say three, four yeah. minutes, I want to quickly define uh, how important is that use case. 
th th that one is not too important. Um, I think certainly that's not the, for because alpha. then you were talking about like, what if the the green that you know original cluster got like destroyed somehow? Then yeah. then what? You can never delete this uh, bucket anymore. No, you, you it's okay. Delete, or? No, you can still delete. The, the question is more uh, along the lines of, can you own a bucket that was created somewhere else? That's what Ben yeah. is asking. Okay, yeah. So I think you probably want to support that, right? Because then it's a, it's a, like unplanned loss. Well, right? I think that also adds more complications in terms of like admins might want to own uh, brownfield buckets that wasn't a part of the cluster that was created in the wrong way. And then mistakenly they, they delete the bucket, not expecting the backing to go away, but the backing goes away. I don't know if you should support that case. Or well, it, so yeah. So, it's so different, say, but if I just restore my, like if I store, um, backed up my YAMLs and then restored it when the cluster went away, I mean, it's, how, how do you have, even know in COSY whether this is this case or that case? I mean, true, true. That's true. Well, there, there would be an issue if you, re, if you restored the, your YAMLs while the, while the COSY controller was running, because it would see the request and try to respond to it. I think I, I, I think no, no, the Cozy controller type. knows if the bucket's already been provisioned or not. Okay. I mean that 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 that, that value has to be there in the object, otherwise, uh, you know, there could be a problem within the original okay. cluster right. as well. Maybe this is one of the differences between buckets and snapshots: is that we we have a we have a forward pointer that that we know it's already been bound, and so the controller can just ignore it. I think that was one of the problems with. When when we were designing snapshots, we we didn't want to have that field unless it was this like import case, uh -huh. um, because we didn't want to have the the same type of binding that we did with PVCs. But I think with buckets, it's okay. Uh, either way, if we if we do end up having to do the things Shing is suggesting that snapshots did, it's very easy. It's just another field and some additional validation rules to ensure that you know they don't set both fields at the same time. So I, I'm not too worried about if we have to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree that we should at least prototype it and prove to ourselves that it's not hard, mm -hmm. um, but but it doesn't need to hold up the rest of the of yeah, the design. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So so let's actually right now it's ten forty five. Um, it sounds like uh, most of us, uh, if not all of us, are okay with moving forward with this approach. Yeah. Jeff, what do you think about uh, uh, the solution we discussed for the static brownfield? Um, are you saying where we we reference the physical backend bucket somehow? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said earlier, we did have a proposal at one point that was going to do that. Um, I'm not, it was pre, it was pre cap or very early before the cap, very much before the cap was ever merged. Um, and I thought some of the issues around that were related to uniqueness of bucket names and what would we, what would that, what does it really mean to reference a backend bucket? Are we giving, are, is it a, a URL? Um, is it a composite field of several pieces of information? Um, and I thought we ended up concluding that it wasn't going to work, but I'm, I can't remember right now why. Well, the earlier assumption was bucket names weren't uh, globally unique, but we know across all three clouds they are. Um, and then the same across, with, with the URL. Are they, and they're globally unique as, with a URL because. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. That, that sure seems re reasonable to me. Um, so, so I think I think it's okay to push this decision to Monday if needed. Uh, if if we still have questions about the feasibility of of this direct reference to the back end bucket, um, but ideally I would like to you know move forward right away. Yeah, what I'm trying to think of is even if we put a URL to refer to the back end bucket instead of would we still want a link to the B? Would we still want a binding between BR and B, between BAs and B? Um, no, uh, once we have that dichotomy of attacho versus provisioner, um, there won't be, um, 
I mean, there, there won't be a BR linking to a B. It'll just be a bunch of BARs pointing to the B. And and all the BAR that you get, that's for brownfield, but for greenfield, I still have a BR, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, and then the the BR causes a back end bucket to be created. It causes a B to be instantiated. Right. Is there a binding between that instantiated B and the BR? Yes, yes. So that's the greenfield case. And and what Ben brought up just now was, let's say. Uh, uh, a bucket's already been created. You're moving it across the cluster, and you still you want to take ownership of the bucket, um, and and you know you you recreate the BR and B, or you just copy the BR and B from the previous cluster over here. Um, can we prevent the bucket from being you know created and bound again? And and uh, again, like Ben was saying, that's possible. Yeah. Hey, yeah was, but if you, if you populate the forward pointer on the bucket request, whatever that field is called with mm -hmm. a value, then the provisioner will see that it's populated and not right. do anything. Yeah. I think what's hard to, to imagine right now, and maybe Jeff, this is what you're saying, is that it's hard to, to understand how the, um, the the brownfield case works and what needs to be supplied in the, in the um, access request, right? The bucket access request. Um, how does that look like? Um, is there any driver specific information there? What's What's kind of the structure now? Because before we, we, we just pointed to to some cozy construct and now we're not. So how does that look like now? Right. We don't we don't have an answer right now and unless you can think of it very quickly. No, I I don't think we have an answer, but I think to to say that this design works for us means to have like some answer to that. Right? We have no answer to um, cross-cluster mutability or cross-cluster ownership or cross-cluster who owns a life cycle. Well, all that becomes moot, right? Like the, that's the whole idea behind uh, this, this approach where you directly point to the back in bucket, that way you, you don't own it, you, you don't mutate it. What you're saying is that Cozy, when Cozy sees a direct reference to the back end bucket, mm -hmm. Um, it only attaches and detaches, but the provisioning life cycle is not cozy. That's problem. all we do with normal brownfield anyway. Is we exactly all brownfield we just like do this. a grant and a revoke. Um, yeah. Yes. I, so, so I think the purpose of say re referencing a URL in brownfield is a cross cluster purpose for maybe easier migration or portability across cluster, but it doesn't give you, in my view at least, it doesn't give you any policy control across clusters because if I change a field in cluster one that says I'm the owner, cluster two has no idea you did that. So, you know, you can have two clusters both thinking they're the owner. I, I just don't see how this solves a cross cl cluster, um, you know, having single pane of management pain across clusters. I didn't understand the question actually. I, I'm saying since there's no mechanism to automate um, setting resources, mutating resources that handles cluster boundaries, you know, cross cluster, we don't have that right now. Um, I think what we would be saying is, is you only ever use the brownfield mechanism when you share across clusters. Um, but I, brownfield makes sense within a cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, so it, within a cluster, you can do greenfield, you can use brownfield. Once you start spanning cluster boundaries, you have to use the brownfield mechanism always. The only situation where the going from brown back to green is, is an interesting scenario is like recovering from a disaster, right? Like my cluster got nuked and I, I, wanna, I wanna continue to, to manage these buckets. So like at that point, I'm sort of asserting control and, and, and there are dangers there, right? Because if you do that on multiple different clusters, then yeah, you end up in a situation where you don't know who the owner is and you're gonna have problems, but like that's, a, that's, not, that's not a solvable problem. Yeah, it's gonna exist regardless. So, yeah. so, so you basically have to say, if you do this, you better know what you're doing. And, and it's not gonna be the normal use case. The normal use case is I wanna share, use the brownfield mechanism and you never get into trouble that way. You can only get into trouble by 
sort of create, you know, going from brown to green. Um, and you, you just have to know what you're doing when you do that. It almost sounds like you're saying if we have a B instance abstracting a back end bucket, once you start thinking about multiple clusters, that model breaks down. And it, I'm almost thinking you're saying we shouldn't even have the abstraction of a B. No, I, I like I like the B and I like having one per cluster, which is the, the, the change that's being suggested today. Right now we would have one per namespace in, in each cluster, which is less ideal. But, but then the, the, the challenge is gonna be, you know, one of those clusters will also have a BR that's bound to it and none of the other ones will, right? They'll all have BARs that are bound to it. And, and, yeah, but and it, it, what is the challenge there? I mean, doesn't it sound better than having yeah. the no, no, BARs refer directly the, the, to the- I'm saying this, this, this is all good. And then and the, the, the problem comes when, if you allow someone to create a BR on another cluster that binds to the B on that cluster, now you have two different clusters that are gonna fight over ownership and like, there's nothing we can do to solve that. Right, that's yeah, just probably shouldn't really right, solve right. it. We, we, we should like, not yeah. attempt to solve that. We should say that, that that's the rope that you can hang yourself with, and so be careful. Um, <laughs> but 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 you you would like that ability to be able to recover from disasters, right? To be able to say, oh, my cluster went away. I just want to go point it at the bucket because I have a backup with a YAML, and so import the bucket, import the BR. Boom! It's like it's like this cluster always owned it, and I know what I'm doing. So. So trust me. I, I think I actually think this piece is is pretty like is pretty clear to me. The the only thing from from the design discussion that we had today that I'm not sure about is what are we doing with the BARs? Are we really detaching these from the bees? Because detaching these make it like a completely different re, um, reference design. Like how do we refer to a bucket uh, for access? And that's kind of taking me. Yeah. to a whole other dimension of this design. I think, I think we mean that we'll still have the bucket, but it'll be like a shell of a bucket, which will be just brown field on the other clusters. And uh, you, you, you can only attach and detach from those buckets. It's just the way the But the access, so what you're saying, so let, let me understand that. You're saying that the BARs, when I, when I construct a BAR, I would still have like in the, the, the diagram here that Jeff uh, created, I would still have to point either to a BR or to a B for, for this to work, for the access to work? You can only point it to a B uh, in, in the cluster where it's shared. L let's, let's, uh, 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 you know, let's strictly talk about the non-taking ownership use case. So just, just using the bucket use case. In that right. case, uh, the BAR would point to a B, but that B object itself is something that you can only attach to but not attach and detach uh, uh, with, but you can't manage its life cycle. No, no put, put life cycle aside, just, that, just access for a second, right? Yeah. So I, I ha we have the two namespaces in this diagram here. On the left side, BARs connect to a BR, right? Mm -hmm. Th this yeah. is how I Greenfield define is these. I, right, right. I, so this is one option to, to get access to a bucket. So I refer to a bucket request. Mm -hmm. And the other would be to refer to a B directly. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't have the, the the what we mentioned here for a second, which is the BAR just has a, you know a bunch of um, URLs and whatever properties that are needed to construct a um, access request uh, directly by the user for the external. Right, like the BAR will not have like the bucket uh, name protocol and all that. Yeah, okay, it, it'll still lie in the bucket object itself. Um, uh, but then, like I said, the bucket object is going to look different in the new cluster. Okay, so that, that sounds much simpler to me to to yeah you know, to, mm -hmm. to imagine how this go forward because we mentioned that before. I wasn't. Yeah, sure. I think uh, yeah. And uh, originally, I also thought uh, we could just have you know that's why we're talking about uniqueness uh, that we could we could put that value in the BAR itself. But uh, when I listened to Ben explain it again, I think he meant uh, we have it point to the bucket still, but uh, okay. yeah. Can you confirm that, Ben? Yeah, that that, that was what I, I meant, and I'd mm -hmm. I'd love to see like a I don't know just 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 walking through all the steps, you know, here like create a bucket, export it to another namespace or to another cluster, mm -hmm. and then what 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 exactly do you do 
you know, with examples of, of what the YAML would look like. Um, that would make it much more concrete, but uh, in my imagination, it, it, it works fine. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're out of time. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, we should just decide right now. Um, let's let's uh, decide on Monday um, once we've had enough time uh, to kind of walk through the steps. Uh, all of us have had the time. Um, just either just mentally in our own minds or maybe someone can prototype. Um, and, and let's make this decision on Monday. So Monday, uh, the way I'm thinking of office hours, so I've been talking about having something called office hours where uh, we'll actually dive deep into the code, talk about how it's designed, how to integrate it, um, and, and uh, you know, how to run it. Um, so it's going to be a session for developers, uh, people, you know, who are writing drivers and also people who want to, you know, uh, rather than reviewing the code on each PR, understand how the code looks right now and suggest improvements. So I'm thinking the way we'll do it is uh, 11 to 11.30, the first part of the meeting, we'll have the usual meeting. And 11.30 to 12, we'll have this office hour session where we'll jump into the code. So that way, um, and, and we're going to do this office hours every alternate week. Um, and, and that way, uh, you know, by doing it this way, we still have uh, the opportunity to have the regular discussions and then use the rest of the time to, um, you know, help out vendors and developers who want to integrate with Cozy and all that kind of things. Does it does sound good? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right. Okay. Talk to you all on Monday. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye. All right. Bye -bye.